Just a warning, this episode contains some graphic material that listeners may find confronting. My phone was running hot, lighting up like an absolute Christmas tree. I'm talking about the morning of Friday, February 26, 2021. And Kate, I reckon you might have been in the same boat. I know. Look, people kept calling me. Did I know what was happening? Did I know what it was about? And what they were ringing about was that there'd been a major development in the Melissa Caddick case. Remember, she'd vanished three months earlier without a trace. And police had just announced there would be a press conference at 8.30am. I can tell you that police have put out a brief statement saying that they will address the media to provide an update on the investigation into the disappearance of missing Dover Heights woman Melissa Caddick. And she's either dead or alive. And if she's alive, they must either know where she is, maybe they know that she's disappeared from the country, Maybe she's in custody. We'll find out at 8.30 this morning. Tom, the fact that it was Assistant Commissioner Mick Willing who was holding the press conference that morning gave you a pretty good indication that whatever it was, it was really big news. Yeah, I remember you and I chatting at the time, Kate, speculating it. Is this it? Has she been murdered? Or has she been arrested? Has she handed herself in? What's going on? And don't forget that only four days earlier, a warrant had been issued for her arrest in relation to the Ponzi scheme. But what was revealed later that morning was just so bizarre. Yes, such an unbelievable plot twist that, look, if this was fiction, you'd be laughed out of the writing room. Welcome to episode eight of Liar Liar, Melissa Caddick and the Missing Millions. I'm Tom Steinfurt, a reporter with 60 Minutes. And I'm Kate McClymont, an investigative journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald. We are delving into one of the most extraordinary crimes of the century. Melissa Caddick, a seemingly successful Sydney businesswoman, turned out to be a sociopathic con artist who stole more than $23 million from clients, mainly family and friends, who thought their funds were being invested in shares. Within hours of her home being raided by the corporate regulator, she disappeared. Where is she? The millionaire is accused of stealing from friends to fund her lavish lifestyle. She hasn't been in touch with her family. She hasn't been in touch with her friends. This was a, a systematic and meticulous attempt to defraud investors. Four, five million? About $10 million. You name it, Chris and Dior, Chanel. She was living off our money. She is a survivor and she would have had a plan. Nothing would surprise any of us. You know how much we love you. you. Just come home, everything's taken care of, you're not in trouble. Hi, it's Melissa Caddick. This episode is all about discoveries. One particular discovery would absolutely turn this case on its head and we are going to come to that one very shortly. But there's one other major discovery that defines the Melissa Caddick story and that is the awful moment when her closest family and friends realised that the woman that they trusted implicitly had robbed them blind. Yeah, in our last episode you might recall that in the days after Melissa first vanished from her Dover Heights home, her nearest and dearest were absolutely devastated because they feared that Melissa had been abducted or, worse yet, murdered. And I said to Billy, I said, something's going on, something's not right. And then we hear about it in the paper six days later that she's been missing. It was like missing six days, sinister sort of implications, and I think you, you grieved for her. Yeah, I did. Didn't suspect anything at that stage. You were just worried about your friend. Worried about my friend, yeah. That was Michelle Leslie and her husband, Billy McMoore. Michelle was Melissa's private chef, turned personal trainer, turned friend and sadly turned investor. Now, as you could hear there, the couple were effectively grieving over Melissa's disappearance. 
they weren't even thinking about the investments they'd made with her. But Kate, for Billy and Michelle and I think a number of other victims, the horrible discovery that they had been duped by Melissa Caddick came on December 5, 2020. We're talking about 23 days after Melissa vanished without a trace. This was a Saturday morning, a glorious first weekend of summer in Sydney, and the kind where you just want to sit out at an outdoor cafe in the sunshine, have a coffee and flick through the paper. But your masthead, the Sydney Morning Herald, that particular morning, featured an article by a journalist called uh, Kate McClymont, and Michelle, well, she remembers the headline clear as day. Con artists of the century. Tom, at the time, I didn't realise that my story would have such a devastating effect on so many people's lives. And as you say, this was the terrible moment when her family and friends realised the sickening truth. And that was their money, their life savings had vanished along with Melissa. Yeah, and there was this all-important telltale detail in your article, Kate, that sent a lot of Melissa's investors really scrambling for their financial records. And of course, central to Melissa's Ponzi scheme was the apparent success of investments on their behalf. Each month, she would send them portfolio statements purporting to be from their Comsec trading accounts, showcasing her extraordinary investment now. Now, obviously, investors at the time clearly didn't know that they were being rorted. However, it turns out all along, the evidence of Melissa's scam had actually been right in front of them. That's right. A genuine Comsec client account number has eight digits, but Melissa's forged Comsec reports had only six. Now, that simple revelation about Caddick's sloppy six-digit forgeries caused an absolute flood of, you know, what can only be described as confusion and grief. The first people to contact me that Saturday morning when the con artists of the century story appeared were Michelle and Billy. And I remember Michelle saying to me that morning, this is the best long con I've ever seen. It's like dirty, rotten scoundrels on steroids. And did you hear from many other victims then? Oh, look, that morning emails just began flooding into my inbox. I mean, here's one. Hi, we had a self-managed super fund with Malava. Our Comsec trading account has only six digits, not the required eight, was one. And look, other people called. This was terrible. Some were almost in tears, saying after reading the story, they'd rushed off to check their paperwork. Yeah, and sadly for those people, their account numbers with Comsec only had six digits as well. Melissa's oldest friend, Kate Horn, checked her account after reading your story. I looked at my Comsec accounts and of course they were all six digits and I went, oh, <laughs> oh my goodness, this is, this is truly happening. This is really happening. Tom, one thing that we learned later was that after this article appeared, one relative, already stressed that Melissa was missing, collapsed and had to be taken to hospital. The penny had dropped and here's what one relative said. This absolute betrayal of her family was almost a greater shock. It made me sick to my stomach. Some other investors had to sweat it out until the Monday morning when they could finally make that stomach-churning call to Comsec. I remember speaking to Cheryl Craft-Reed and her wife, Faye, about that heart-stopping moment. They didn't even know the names of the account. We're giving them the name of our account, and they're going, no, no, there's nothing here. Oh, can you give the account numbers? Are those numbers not right? And we're going, oh, no. Is it it right that the person on the other end of the line then said to you, oh, hang on, have you invested with a a lady called Melissa Caddick? Yes. Mm. And then they told us they couldn't talk to us any further. And then they gave us the name of the ASIC investigators and said we should call them. But I think the minute I realised our money was missing was when this lovely woman on the other end of the phone said, I hope it all goes well. Good luck with that. And there's a tone that you just realise there's no account. There's no money. Melissa isn't just missing. Your money is missing. Matthew, the husband of Melissa's employee, Nicole, also felt ill 
when he made that Monday morning call to Comsec. We rang Comsec and asked them to track these accounts. My mum and dad, my kids, my uncle and aunts, ours. None of them existed. She was living off our money. The car her husband was driving around in, that was my mum and dad's money. It's just disgusting. And to think she did that to family and friends. Nicole said that Melissa's brother Adam, one of his mates from Perth, was about to hop on a plane to fly to Sydney to support Adam. That was until he checked his Comsec account and found out it didn't exist either. An elderly couple, we'll call them Sue and Bob Burton, were great friends of Melissa's parents, Barb and Ted Grimley from Connell's Point. Now, the Burtons made that same horrible discovery that Monday morning when they actually went to their local Commonwealth Bank and asked if they could access their Comsec account. The teller apologised, saying, I'm sorry, but these accounts were never opened with us. So the Burtons then asked if it was possible that the account had just been closed, but this polite bank worker had to say, look, I'm sorry, that there's no record of that account at all on the system. And that means it simply never existed. Their $450,000 nest egg, plus their supposed profits that Melissa had been spouting, that was all gone. Over the years, Barb and Ted had proudly told their friends about their daughter, Melissa's financial wizardry, and several relatives and friends of the Grimleys decided to invest. Yes, so in July 2019, the Burtons made out a cheque for $450,000 to Comsec, thinking, well, that's who they need to give their money to in order for the shares to be bought by Melissa on that particular trading platform. The next thing they know, Melissa was on the phone, and I can't believe this, she literally tried on the line, the dog ate my homework. I know, I can't believe this either. But according to court documents, this is exactly what Melissa told the Burtons. I am very sorry, but my dog has somehow gotten a hold of the cheque you gave and chewed it up. I won't be able to deposit it. I am sorry to ask you this, but would you be able to draw a replacement cheque but made out to the Malava Trust? I can come by and collect it this afternoon. In her affidavit to the corporate watchdog, Sue Burton said that she was a little taken aback by this request and she had some reservations about making the check out to Melissa's personal company, Malava, rather than Comsec. But Tom, due to her long-standing relationship with Melissa... She just made out the cheque as Melissa asked. And this was the the crux of Melissa's con. She preyed on people who already trusted her. And and this particular one, it's, it's another one of those sliding door moments where Melissa, well, she could have been unmasked, but again, she just slipped through the net because her victims knew her. They trusted her. The Melissa they knew wouldn't do anything so dastardly. So criminal. So the months went by and as the magnitude of Melissa's crimes grew, so did theories about her whereabouts, which were discussed endlessly. As we mentioned in the last episode, even the police commissioner himself weighed in, urging Melissa Caddick to hand herself in. Which brings us to that crazy Friday morning in late February 2021. And this is when speculation really hit fever pitch as to exactly what had happened to Melissa And there was this seismic breakthrough in the Caddick case. This is Nine News with Davina Smith. Good morning. It is a mystery that has stumped the public and police for three months. But now a major breakthrough in the disappearance of Sydney businesswoman Melissa Caddick. Some major breaking news right now on the case of missing Sydney woman Melissa Caddick. A breakthrough that presents more questions than provides answers. Certainly significant developments. Police are expected to confirm in the next uh, five minutes or so that Melissa Caddick is no longer alive. They're going to give us further details, but we have an understanding that this case may have played out on the south coast of New South Wales. It was a jaw-dropping find on a beach six hours south of Sydney. Let's go straight to Assistant Commissioner Mick Willing. Last Sunday, Sunday the 21st of February, A shoe was located on the shoreline of the National Park south of Tathra by campus. 
Within that shoe were the remains of a human foot. That foot and the shoe, which matched the size and description of a shoe that Melissa Caddick was seen wearing during the execution of the ASIC search warrant, were conveyed to the New South Wales Health Forensic and Science Services section here in Sydney, where DNA from the foot was last night matched to DNA, a DNA sample from Melissa Caddick's toothbrush and from family members. Tom, it seems that two campers noticed a washed-up running shoe which contained the remains of a human foot, mainly bones and a small amount of tissue. They called the police. Three teenage boys found a shoe and remains of a foot that had washed up on Sunday. Probably about two o'clock when I saw the police car drive down into the car park and half an hour later and a copper was coming back to get some um, evidence bags. Yeah, the campers found the running shoe on Sunday afternoon, that's the 21st of February, but it wasn't until the Thursday night that the DNA match came through. Now, what it did, senior police were briefed on this breakthrough and Melissa Caddick's family, including her husband, Anthony Coletti, and her 14-year-old son, were informed of the news. At the press conference, we heard Mick Willings say that the shoe, a dark grey Asics Gel Nimbus 22, matched the size and the description of the running shoe Melissa Caddick was wearing when police raided her home. But you might recall when Melissa first went missing, police actually put out a public alert saying she was wearing, amongst other things, Nike runners. But they clarified that they later learned that was, in fact, incorrect. And after she had been raided by ASIC, she'd left her house in her ASICs. Tom, I remember you and I standing outside police headquarters discussing this really extraordinary turn of events. Yeah, and look, on a human level, this must have just been utterly devastating news for particularly Melissa's son, as well as her wider family and, of course, her husband, Anthony. I know, because in some ways, no news is good news, because there's always hope that she was still alive. And I do remember thinking about the turmoil in the lives of that family. I mean, first of all, they'd already had the shock that Melissa was being accused of stealing millions of dollars from those closest to her. And now here they are learning that her partial remains have washed up on some remote beach so far from home. And I think when this news broke, uh, my initial gut reaction was, well, that's it. That's the end of the line for this story. Same here. I thought Melissa Caddick's foot being found was the final chapter of this incredible tale. Or as John Colley, the screenwriter of Happy Feet, expressed it much more eloquently on Twitter, this is a Cinderella Noir ending. Yeah, but what would we know, Kate? This was not the end. It was only the beginning of an arguably even stranger series of events. Yes, because there were so many unanswered questions. I mean, where was the rest of her body? How did her foot get there? Had she taken her own life or, or had she been murdered? I mean, apart from those murder theories, speculation was rife with plenty of people that Melissa Caddick had cut off her own foot and was still living the high life on the stolen millions with her one good leg. And look, I mean, clearly this sounds implausible, but there were a number of Melissa's victims that were just adamant Melissa was so scheming and so conniving that this was all probably just part of her big grand plan. This is victims Michelle and Billy. When I spoke to them a few days after that news of the foot discovery came through. When you heard the news about Melissa last week and the discovery, what was the first thing you texted a friend? Oh, my first reaction is, it's only a foot. Where's the rest of the body? Is there cement evidence to say she's actually dead? And then when I looked back at it and then saw that it was only a foot, I've gone, "Mm, she's capable of anything. (laughs) What do you mean by she's capable of anything? Well, she could still be alive. Maybe it's just something that she wanted to put out there to calm everything down. If you find a foot, that means that she must be dead. But who would know? I mean, it does feel extremely unlikely, but you honestly think she's capable of... 
throwing out Absolutely. a red herring like that. Absolutely. Yep. How a person with no surgical training could amputate their own foot without any medical help, Tom, to me that defies logic. Yeah, but it's kind of on brand. This whole story defies logic, doesn't it, Kate? No, I, that's true. At, at first, I kind of dismissed theories like that one out of hand because I agree, no human in their right mind is going to chop off their own foot. But the point that the victims have made to me is it's kind of a fair one. No one in their right mind could steal millions of dollars off their friends and family, including their own parents either. So if you can do one of those things, why not the other? I guess you're right. But again, this is one of the points in the case where everyone seemed to have a theory. Forensic psychologist Tim Watson Munro believed Melissa was indeed dead, but he speculated on Channel 7 Sunrise program that as Melissa Caddick was clearly a narcissist, murder was more likely than suicide. He also made the point that a lot of other people raised with us. Although it's not totally impossible that she would have floated all that way over three months, I think it's highly improbable and more likely that she was killed close to where the shoe was found. It would be the perfect crime to kill her Leave a foot on a beach. When you think about it, the chances of finding this shoe, I mean, needle in the haystack, doesn't do it justice. And Tom, you were at Bonda Beach just a few days later. Yeah, and look, Kate, it's a pretty serious trek to get there. We're talking about a six hour drive south of Sydney, and then you end up on this pothole riddled dirt road that leads to a secluded campground in the middle of this thick bushland and from there it's another 15 minute walk through scrub before you eventually climb a steep rise and all of a sudden wow it just opens up you're treated to this stunning stretch of gold and sand and you can see very clearly once you get there why this is called the sapphire coast it is just stunning but it's also really remote and watching the waves roll in there you really do feel like you could be the last person left on earth the day i was there There was almost no other soul to be seen, except in the distance I spied a a guy and his dog, so I went for a bit of a walk down there closer. And it turned out it was a lone policeman with a search dog called Tilia, and they'd both spent hours scouring the beach looking for clues. And I ended up having a a walk with them and chatting for about 40 minutes, and, and it was pretty apparent then just how desperate they were for any sort of lead and how much of a needle in a haystack search this was, as you said. But there's one strange coincidence about this location where the foot washed up. It was on this very beach decades earlier that Melissa had been there for school camps. I mean, Tom, what were the chances that this would be the very place all these years later that Melissa's fate would become apparent? It's truly bizarre and things just kept getting stranger as if the shock announcement of finding Melissa's partial remains wasn't enough. The rumour mill then went into absolute overdrive after Sydney's tabloid newspaper, The Daily Telegraph, published an article casting doubt on Melissa Caddick's foot naturally washing up so far south down the coast. And what really raised eyebrows was that the article was based on comments from Superintendent Joe McNulty. Now, Joe McNulty was not only the boss of the New South Wales Marine Command, he was the very officer who had been in charge of the ocean search for Caddick once she'd been reported missing. Yeah, so this is a bloke who clearly should know what he's talking about. And he was adamant that the running shoe in question here, it appeared in his mind to be in too good a condition to have been in the water for three months. And he also thought it was highly unlikely that that footwear could travel so far south. This is an actor recounting what he told The Telegraph. Something in the water for that long, say a bit of flotsam or jets, and that washes onto the shore, has got green growth on it. At first examination, the shoe doesn't appear to have been in the water for three months. It is really irregular for bodies that may have entered the ocean at the Gap or Dover Heights to end up on the south coast. Usually they wash up in the bottom corner of Maroubra Beach before the Botany Bay headland, and that is normally within a couple of days. OK, so we probably need a couple of quick explainers here. Firstly, for those not from Sydney, Maroubra Beach and Botany Bay are about 
10 to 20 kilometres respectively south of Dover Heights. They're not hundreds of kilometres away like Bourne Beach. Yeah, and Flotsam and Jetsam, that sort of marine debris, Superintendent McNulty made it clear that normally anything like that that's been in the ocean for three months, it would have barnacles or algae on it. But Melissa's shoe, well, it didn't. McNulty also said that while it was theoretically possible for a body to be swept up by the East Australian current and to drift along for 100 kilometres in a single day, but in all their years, they'd never actually come across this happening. Not in my career of 30 years have I seen anything like this. That article also suggested that police couldn't rule out the possibility that Caddick had had some help from accomplices to deal with the millions of dollars she is alleged to have stolen. And that then could have been the motive to murder her. In April, Melissa's family held a memorial service and a private cremation of her remains. Anthony Coletti has revealed that since then, he's been keeping his wife's ashes in an ASIC shoebox. To date, we are yet to hear from the coroner as to the likely cause of death or or whether there were even enough human remains in the shoe to come to any sort of conclusion. These crucial questions are going to be addressed when the inquest into Caddick's disappearance and suspected death starts in September. But Kate, trying to solve the mystery of how and why Melissa Caddick's foot was found so many hundreds of kilometres away from Sydney Well, it brings us to a pretty extraordinary case which for years intrigued North Americans. And this is where we need another warning here. We're going to be covering some pretty confronting content in the next section and some listener discretion is advised. This is the bizarre mystery of the 21 disembodied feet which washed up along the British Columbia coast near Vancouver, Canada, over a period of years. Now, was there a serial killer on the loose chopping off feet? And where were the rest of the bodies? Here's forensic pathologist Matthew Ord, who's based in Vancouver. Over the last 15 or so years, we really have had quite an extraordinary number of disarticulated feet wash up on our beaches. And I think it's about 20 feet or so in the last 15 years. So quite a remarkable number of feet. We all have, I think, a, a natural morbid fascination with such matters and I think that people certainly have a tendency to you know to tend towards conspiracy theory and theories of murder most foul. Acclaimed American science journalist Erica Engelhaupt has examined this baffling case of the 21 washed up feet in her book Gory Details Adventures from the Dark Side of Science. So the first foot that really started this whole phenomenon was found in 2007 in the summer and one uh, right foot washed up on the shore of a beach. And then about six days later, another foot washed up nearby. And they were both men's size 12 feet uh, inside sneakers, but they were both right feet. There was no way they could have possibly come from the same body. Over the years, more and more feet washed up in the Salish Sea between Vancouver and Seattle. I mean, there were just so many questions. Why feet? Why the Salish Sea of all places in the world for them to be washing up? Um, You know, why would this happen? And could they have actually been uh, severed feet or, or, um, you know, is there foul play involved? There are so many questions. And um, so I decided to really kind of dig into some of the scientific literature and try to understand what was going on. Erica's deep dive into the science behind this bizarre phenomenon of the disembodied feet is just as riveting as any good conspiracy theory. First up, the accepted view that bodies bloat and rise to the surface after a couple of days. So studies have shown that, surprisingly, um, bodies tend to be more likely to sink overall than to float. We often think that okay, well, if you go into the water, you know, normally we do have a tendency to float in water. If we're relaxed, we'll float to the surface. And you would imagine that if if there's air in your lungs that you would float. 
And so for a long time, the kind of idea in science was that a drowned person who had taken water into their lungs would sink, but that if you didn't drown, you would float. But according to Erica's research, if a person is already dead when they hit the water, for various reasons, including what they're wearing, the body can be pulled down and sinks. And once a body sinks, interestingly, it tends to stay sunken. It doesn't tend to bob back up uh, quite as often as we might imagine or as the, uh, the crime shows might have you believe where the body you know, starts to decompose, fills with gases and bobs to the surface. Um, that doesn't always happen, it turns out. And, and often a body will uh, sink and stay sunken Erica said that if the body does float, then it's more likely to wash ashore and be found relatively quickly. And it's going to decompose differently as well as it's at the surface where there's plenty of air and sunlight. But underneath the water, it's another story. According to Erica Engelhaupt, once a body has sunk, marine predators get to work. Now, this was revealed in scientific studies of the decomposition of pigs in the Salish Sea, where all those Canadian feet washed up. What happened when they looked at the decomposition of pigs in the Salish Sea, so actually in the same body of water, uh, very conveniently, (laughs) that the feet had been turning up in, they saw that scavengers, such as lobsters, crabs, and shrimp, could actually very quickly decompose a body. They could basically start scavenging and in some cases skeletonize a body in a matter of days. Forensic pathologist Matthew Ward agrees that the decomposition of a body also depends on whether it had injuries such as those that have been caused by a fall. You know looking at what I know about this unfortunate case of Melissa Caddick it it seems to me to be highly likely that she she committed suicide and died either as, as a result of striking rocks or hitting the water or drowning in the water. And then when the body was present in the water after that time, the body would have been subjected to processes of decomposition, which would have rendered the body's tissues soft and weak and fragile. And also the process would have been accelerated undoubtedly by marine predation, crabs, lobsters, fish, sharks on occasion, and so on. And as a result of these processes, and also the movement of the body in the water, maybe banging up against rocks and so on, I think it's likely that the foot would have become detached from the rest of the body. According to both Erica and Matt, the ankle is a fairly weak part of the body, with tendons and ligaments holding the joints of the ankle together. It's quite common for the feet to become detached at the ankle. But because of the amount of bones in the foot, feet are pretty heavy and they tend to sink to the bottom of the ocean, except for one crucial factor. But the thing that's really pr- it's, is of interest here is that we have, as I say, had many, many individual disarticulated feet, and most of these feet seem to be present in running shoes. And I think the reason for that is, as, as you know from your own personal experience, I'm sure that running shoes over the recent years have become more and more advanced in their design and construction, and many of them contain pockets of air the layer bubbles in the soles that make it soft to run on. But of course, the, the byproduct of these air, po- air pockets is that it makes the footwear more buoyant. Erica also pointed out that it was significant that the Canadian feet began washing up from about 2007. So almost all of the feet that have been found have been in some kind of a sneaker-like shoe um, or a hiking boot that's similar in construction to a sneaker. And it was around that time in the you know, mid-2000s, uh, 2005, 2007 kind of time frame, when you started seeing a lot more shoe manufacturers using these really lightweight foams. There's a lot of air mixed into that foam, which makes them more buoyant. And so our, our footwear has become more floaty, <laughs> more buoyant <laughs> over time. And so... If you do end up with a body in the water, you're just much more likely to not only have the foot come off of the body, but for that foot to be then able to float. DNA matches from the Canadian feet revealed that their owners were mainly hikers who had slipped and fallen, or boating accidents, and in some cases, suicide. Not one of them was revealed 
to have met with foul play. Erica Engelhaupt said another reason these 21 feet washed up was because of the currents and tides, as well as the islands and channels, which prevented the feet from washing back out into the ocean. We also asked Erica about the widespread conspiracy theories that Melissa Caddick had cut off her own foot to throw investigators off the scent. I think you've got a fascinating case there. And what made me laugh was this idea that was posited that perhaps Melissa Caddick had severed her own foot and put it into the water to throw detectives off the case. If you think about the anatomy of a foot, and I think this is quite relevant to your case there in Australia, it would be very difficult uh, to cut off a foot, either to chop it off or saw it off um, or, or slice it off in any way without cutting through bone. There's a really kind of complicated arrangement of, of bones at the top of the foot and the ankle uh, and the bottom of the leg that makes it almost impossible to get a clean slice without cutting through bone. Okay, so we know that a foot in a running shoe is not only buoyant, but the shoe provides some protection as well from marine predators. But Kate, what about where Melissa's shoe was found? The Australian coastline, of course, is completely different to the area around Vancouver, and so are the currents. Now, Melissa's shoe washed up almost 400 kilometres south of Sydney, as we said, on a remote, deserted beach. Yeah, and this is where the currents come into it, and look, particularly the powers of the East Australian current, because, well, some of you might remember, they actually shot to prominence because of the well-known animated film Finding Nemo. This is one of the strongest ocean currents in the world, basically a superhighway of fast-flowing water that runs south from the Great Barrier Reef all the way down to Tasmania. We've asked Moni Rowan, a professor of oceanography at the University of New South Wales, to tell us a bit more about this. The current is called the East Australian Current. There's a southward flow right along the coast, most of the way, on average, all the way from Brisbane to Tasmania. It's the strongest, it's the warmest, it's our most powerful ocean current. It can flow at the surface anywhere between one to two metres per second, which is about four to eight kilometres per hour. So maybe it's about the same as a fast walk. Professor Rowan said that it might take a week to 10 days for Melissa Caddick's body to travel as far as it did if it went in a straight line. But the current does something very unusual when it reaches Foster, about 220 kilometres north of Sydney. Huge eddies form, and these large rotating whirlpools of water can be 100 k's wide. Now we know that the ocean is a swirling body of eddies and currents that go and rotate in different directions, and there's wind forcing and there's tides, there's all sorts of different things going on. So... It is plausible that something that was dropped in the ocean off Sydney ended up on the south coast of New South Wales 90 to 100 days later. Now, in an extraordinary coincidence, only two days before Melissa Caddick vanished, and this is the very day that ASIC was in court freezing her assets, Professor Rowan and her team, they were conducting an experiment to track just how far the currents would take three biodegradable drifters. Those items were fitted with satellite tracking devices and dropped off the coast at Port Stephens, just north of Newcastle, which is about 150 kilometres north of Sydney. These very purpose-built drifters that track the very surface currents, so they really were a very similar example to what might be considered a floating shoe. The fact that the drifters were very similar to a running shoe made what happened next so interesting. Like, get this, Tom. The first one took a month to wash up at Jarvis Bay. Now, this is 250 kilometres south from where it first started. Another one washed up at Wollongong, and that's also south of Sydney. But it's interesting that the objects didn't float in a straight line. They went north and then they went east and then they came back and then they went round and round in circles and one washed up at Wollongong, one washed up at Jarvis Bay. But showing how variable the ocean is, the the third drifter actually travelled north, eventually washing up in Warramai National Park near Newcastle, 
not very far from where it was first deployed. Professor Rowan provided information to the New South Wales Police in relation to the discovery of the shoe, and she said it was quite possible for the shoe to have travelled that distance. Having looked at the ocean circulation that occurred through November through February, and having looked at the drifters that we deployed at the same time, this scenario is well within the realm of possibility. So according to Professor Rowan, it was certainly possible for a shoe to be carried so far. But there was one last thing we wanted to know. Why Bonda Beach? There are so many different forces at play. You have surface winds, you have surface waves, you have tides, we have breaking waves, you have the geometry of a beach, which direction it faces, if it will be retained or not. It was just the perfect confluence of events that allowed this object to be washed up. And there are plenty of times that things are not washed up. One of the big unknowns in this case is if Melissa Caddick did take her own life, exactly where did that happen? And just another warning here, this this is the part of the episode that some people might find distressing or triggering, so some discretion is advised. Because of its towering sandstone cliffs, the gap at Watson's Bay in Sydney's east is a notorious suicide spot, the unfortunate setting for the final moments of many people's lives. I'm Glenn Johns and I was a police diver for 18 years. People who took their lives around Sydney chose the gap probably because of easy access there and and the height. The gap is on the southern peninsula of of Sydney Harbour. It's uh, an ocean cliff. It can lead directly into the water and onto the rocks, depending on where you position yourself on the gap itself. Now, Melissa's house in Dover Heights is only a couple of hundred metres from the cliffs and they have the most breathtaking views looking out across the Pacific Ocean. Now, if Melissa turned left there, it's about four k's along the Federation Cliff Walk to the Gap at Watson's Bay. And then there are also more cliffs if you continue walking a bit further on. And this is to what's known as Sydney Heads, basically the gateway to Sydney Harbour. And if she turned right and headed south, it's a couple of kilometres south to Bondi Beach. And again, it's spectacularly steep cliffs all the way along. Glenn Johns also said that there were two major factors which would have hampered the search for Melissa. One, of course, was that 30-hour delay before Anthony Coletti reported that Melissa was missing. The second thing was, depending on where she was, well, she could have landed on rocks or gone straight into the water. Glenn Johns explained that if it's low tide, a recovery can be done pretty quickly. But if the body has suffered trauma and the tide is high, the outcome can be different. It's pretty crucial to know whether it was low or high tide that morning. Now, Melissa Caddick left the house at 5.30am. I checked the tidal charts and it was high tide at 6.30am. So that would make it more likely for a body to be swept out to sea. Glenn also remarked that within 500 metres to a kilometre offshore from the cliffs, the current there is unbelievably strong. Um, I've personally been off off the heads in certain parts of Sydney and actually been in the water, and um, I've been separated from a boat, and I couldn't reach the boat um, back onto the boat because the current was that strong. We asked Glenn whether there were many instances of people taking their own life at the Gap and their body never being found. Definitely there were. There were people seen to actually uh, jump from the gap and never found. And of course, there are those circumstances where cars or personal uh, belongings have been found on the gap and you can only just assume they, they, they jumped from the gap because their bodies were never found. Tom, there's one anecdote that's worth talking about here. And this one is sadly quite confronting. And it involves the tragic tale of the Dunbar, which was Australia's worst maritime disaster. But the reason we're talking about this is that it might help our listeners to understand just how treacherous the waters below are. There's a plaque at the Gap which commemorates the disaster and it reads, 
Dunbar was wrecked about 500 yards south of this spot in a heavy northeast gale at night on August the 20th, 1857. From a total of 122, there was only one survivor. This Haranka was recovered by local residents 50 years later and is now set up in memory of the tragic event. In stormy weather more than 160 years ago, the captain of the Dunbar appears to have mistaken the semicircular shape of the gap for the entrance to the harbour. I checked the Sydney Morning Herald's archives from Monday the 24th of August 1857. I will spare you the gruesome details of this eyewitness account. It is pretty disturbing. But this person recounts bodies being smashed against rocks, body parts being tossed in the waves, and circling sharks. Okay, so a fairly macabre diversion there from Kate. I'm sorry about that, Tom. Look, we'll excuse it because it does actually provide a a pretty important picture of just how perilous those waters are at the bottom of the cliffs. And Tom, a coronial inquest later found that Some of the 17 bodies washed up within Sydney Harbour, a handful washed up on beaches a short way down the coast. But the bodies of more than 100 passengers on the Dunbar were never found. And it may be that we'll never know what happened to Melissa Caddick that day and how it was that her foot came to be found on that remote beach so far from Sydney. But we did ask two forensic psychiatrists for their thoughts on what might have been going through Melissa's mind following the shock of that police raid on her house. Here's Olaf Nielsen. I imagine that she rehearsed it in her mind many times as the kind of escape fantasy from this terrible predicament of, um, of knowing uh, you, you know, that the whole Ponzi scheme was unsustainable. The predicament was there and then with the arrival of the police. The cliff was right behind her house and that's all she could do there and then, you know. We asked Dr Julian Parmigiani if the fraudsters he dealt with ever had a contingency plan. Could Melissa have money stashed somewhere or a plane in a hangar? Because she did claim she was taking flying lessons. That stuff belongs in the movies. It really doesn't belong to your average fraudster. The planning is mostly on committing the fraud and any escape plan, it's always half-baked. Instead, Dr Parmigiani surmised that the thought going through Melissa's mind as the police searched her house was... That's it. The jig's up. It's finished. However, there is one key person who refuses to believe that Melissa Caddick took her own life. And that is her husband, Anthony Coletti. I know she didn't. I know she didn't. I know she didn't, he told the Australian newspaper in February 2022. But Coletti refuses to accept that she did anything wrong at all. I don't believe that she took from her friends. I don't believe that she took from anyone. With Melissa now missing and presumed dead, it's the increasingly bizarre behaviour of her husband, Anthony, that becomes a focal point of the story. In our next episode, we'll have a look at the unusual dynamic of his relationship with Melissa and whether that had any effect on some of the decisions he made when his wife went missing. We'll also take you on Coletti's roller coaster ride as he lands in legal strife due to his unwavering belief that whatever happened to his wife, it was all the fault of the corporate watchdog. He would believe anything Melissa tells him. Um, I'm quite confident of that. Even if he didn't know what was going on, he would believe everything he was told. Oh, she was dominant. And he, to the point where I think, just was the lapdog who did what he was told. Given the childlike and bullying nature your lawyer, Mr Hayter, has shown, I now see it as straight-out harassment. If you have found any of the content of today's episode troubling, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Liar Liar is a co-production of the Sydney Morning Herald and 60 Minutes. It was written and presented by Kate McClymont and Tom Steinford. Michael Evans is the Sydney Morning Herald's investigations editor and the series supervising producer. This episode was produced and edited by David McMillan with Tracy Hannaford for 60 Minutes. Kirsty Thompson is the executive producer of 60 Minutes. 
For more of Australia's best investigative journalism, subscribe to the Sydney Morning Herald by visiting smh.com.au and watch 60 Minutes on 9 or 9 Now every Sunday. If you know more about Melissa Caddick's disappearance, please contact the team by emailing liarliarpodcast at smh.com.au. A portion of Anthony Coletti's audio in this episode is from Spotlight, The Vanishing, and is used courtesy of The Seven Network. Some names and voices have been changed in this series to protect the identity of victims. Victims.